السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه It is with great pleasure inshallah that I introduce our brother here Brother Jamil Johnson He's a lot of things to a lot of people To some people he was Mr. Uh, assistant at the House of Representatives To some other people he's daddy To some people he's Mr. Jamil Johnson To us he's our brother in Islam Brother Jamil has been a Muslim for over 24 years, alhamdulillah, by the mercy of Allah. And he had what uh, I call the, uh, the Musa experience. The Musa experience meaning that if you look at the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he had a really, really unique perspective. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him in the midst of the greatest government at that time, the greatest empire at that time, and at that, he learned how the government worked from the inside. So, Brother Jamil Johnson, uh, he had that similar experience, which he'll give you the details of. Uh, uh, his children, alhamdulillah, were basically raised in Dar es Salaam and Al Huda, and he's been one of those uh, people who have been working behind the scenes. He, he likes to say that he doesn't like to get in the forefront, but he works really hard behind the scenes. A lot of times when uh, the Muslims need to get things done politically on this end, Believe me, Brother Jamil is part of that. So it's my, with great pleasure I introduce our Muslim brother and someone who I personally call a friend, Brother Jamil Johnson. Inna alhamdulillahi wa nahmaduhu wa nastahinuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina man yahdihillahu fala mudilillahu wa man yudlil fala yadilahu Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, I want to thank the brothers for inviting me, Brother Ahmed Elmi, I know who runs the Dawa pro program, uh, Brother Abdul Hakim for that um, probably much too generous introduction. Um, I, I've never considered myself to be a captivating speaker, so my hope is that whatever I can impart to you tonight is beneficial without being boring. And I know that if Abdul Hakim was here last week, which I was not, um, I've got some tough shoes to follow in. So I'll just try to do my best, inshallah. Um, be patient with me. I was asked to come in as a part of this program, uh, which is my journey to Islam, um, so that we can, I guess, relate our experiences. For those of us, um, this is a part of the Dawah program at PGMA, um, which attempts to obviously spread the word of El Islam to those who do not know it. Um, hopefully what it can also do is help, you know, when you know your brother or sister better, and I assume there'll be some sisters who'll be doing this too, um, is that when you know them better, you become closer to them. Um, if you know the story of when the Muhajireen made the hij hijra to Yathrib, which became Medina, one of the things that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi did it, was he paired them up. Because even though we say the believers are brothers one to another, it's not the same if you don't know the person. So by pairing them up, they became intimate friends and intimate b b believers so that you reach out to one another because this is not just someone I see at the masjid, it's someone whom I know. Um, so what's, what's my story? Well, I was raised, as many African Americans in this country, I was raised in a Christian household. Um, I was born in the Bronx, and we grew up, and I'll, I'll never forget the name, Trinity Baptist Church in the Bronx. So in 220, I'm gonna forget, um, in, the, in the Bronx, uh, Pastor Lloyd, that's how well I remember it, because my family was, you know, fairly avid churchgoers. And I don't just mean my immediate family, like you know my mother and father and sisters and so on and so forth, but we lived um, very close to, particularly my mother's family. So it wasn't just us; it was you know my aunt, aunt, aunt Louise and my aunt Arlene and and you know my aunt Toots and uh, Uncle Willie. You know we all lived kind of we could all walk to each other's houses from that point. So we were very much part of the large church fa fa family. And we did, you know, all the usual things. We went to church. Um, we did the Sunday school. Um, summer camp was at the church. We even had, at one point, even though my sisters and I just did it because we wanted to get out of school, 
We noticed that a lot of the Catholic kids used to have a thing where a bus would pick them up on Wednesdays and take them over to the church for uh, religious education. And so we asked if we could get, get, get that done. And so we ended up going over to our church for the same thing. But the reality is it was really because it was a good excuse to get out of school. We're envious of the Catholic kids who were leaving school in the middle of the day, and we wanted to do the same thing. But through that, I developed always a belief in God. And when you're young, you know, it's very interesting. When you're young, they teach you um, to believe in God, one God. You don't really get so much into the Trinity when you're very young. So that was always my understanding. You know, one God, Jesus, his son, so on and so forth. What's interesting, I think the first thing that, you know, in which Allah began to open my eyes took place actually on my 13th birthday. It was, uh, can I hold on? If any of you, well, I guess I have to say when it was because some of you aren't old enough to remember. But those of us who are old enough rem remember, remember when the miniseries, the most watched miniseries in American history, Roots, came on TV. Anybody re remember that? The first time? Um, see, everybody's, a lot of people not raising their hand, so they don't remember that. So I have to say it was 1977. Uh, oh, well, we, all right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the very first episode, I mean, I remember the whole thing you know, very well. We watched it every single day. Matter of fact, when it came on again in 2007, the 30th anniversary, I made sure my kids watched it every single day. And the first episode struck me the most because, you know, you watch him, you watch him and his family raising it in West Africa. Um, you know, he grows up to become a man and so on and so forth. And then he's captured by the slave traders. And when he gets on the ship, he begins to, to pray. And what does he say? He says, oh, Allah the Munificent, Allah the, 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 the Merciful. And there were other scenes later on in the miniseries, like when they were having a dance and Kunta Kinte was in the bar and they went to find where Kunta Kinte was. I think Fiddler went to find where he was. And when he came in, he was in the bar making Salat. And it always just made me think as a young person, I said, well, you know, in my family, we can trace at least my mother's side back to my great grandfather in Virginia to 1865. Now, what happened in 1865? The Civil War ended. So those are like the first records that we, we have. My great-grandparents on my mother's side um, were Virginia slaves. And so when I looked at that, it just always made me think, well, some of the, at least some of the people brought over here at that time were, were m Muslims. But as you know, during the, you know, with the slave trade, you couldn't practice your religion. You couldn't speak your language. Everything had to be, they wanted you to be raised as a slave. So everything that was from before had to be erased. So it always just made me think. I said, if this had not happened, was my family Muslim before they were brought over here? And had this not been the situation, would we still be Muslim? Now, I never even considered, you know, at the time that I would become Muslim. It was like, you know, Christianity is the right religion. I know it's right, and so on and so forth. But it just always stuck in the back of my head. When I was in high school, um, and some of you may remember this organization, um, the Ansar Allah community. Now, the Ansar Allah community, and this is where the term I think so-called Muslim comes into effect. You know, we had this thing you know, a couple of weeks ago with the homosexuals sitting and say, shouldn't just call them so-called Muslims. But as we found out more about this community, it's accurate. But they were big in New York, particularly in Bushwick, Brooklyn. That was like, any time I thought of Bushwick, Brooklyn, I thought of the Ansar Allah community. And they were big givers of dawah. You know, they were on the, on the trains. They had you know, the um, stands with the oils, the incense, and so on and so forth. They would give out the books and so on and so, so forth. Uh, so me and my friends would get a couple of books, take a look at them, and most of them, because they were targeted toward the Afro-American community, focused on comparative religion. A lot of the same stuff that Ahmed Dededa used to do. You've got his pamphlets. You know, Jesus and the Quran, you know, those kind of things. And we used to read them, take a look, say interesting, you know, facts, but it never in high school, you know, my mind was on a lot of other things. Um, some halal, some haram. But that wasn't really a big issue back then. 
But in high school and in college, I took um, Old Testament classes. Old Testament is li literature, and Old Testament his his history in college. And the interesting point of it was that, besides making me read the Bible more, was that it began to make the Bible a bit more, and the history a bit more realistic, as opposed to, you know, sometimes when you read religious books and you hear about the prophets of the past and so on and so forth, it almost doesn't sound like real life. You know, it, it sounds like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or something to that effect. But reading it in that way kind of made it more realistic, you know, what people would be going through. Um, and it made be the understanding a little bit more of the monotheism that was preached at that, you know, the monotheism that's in the Old Testament. And so when I came home, and I was still, at that time, I was still, you know, my mother was like, you know, I hope when you go to college, you're gonna find a church home and so on and so forth. And I always felt, look, I'm gonna be a good Christian one day. But right now, I'm in my 20s, I'm in college, you know, I got other things on my mind, but one day. And, you know, if I'd known better at the time, I would've said, inshallah. But one thing it always made me think of was the fact that I said, you know what? I've been reading a bit, little bit about Islam. You know, I even did a paper on comparative religions at that time. And I said, I said, you know what? At this point, I'm not gonna necessarily call myself Christian or anything else. I'm just gonna ask God to guide me to that whichever is right. We used to have a, a, a saying, and the saying was there's only one truth. And I said, you know what? God, whatever that truth is, guide me to it. But this is still kind of a feeling of, you know, it's hard to let go of your, your roots. So this is still kind of a feeling of, well, I know one day I'll end up in the church. So when I came home from co college, I developed that mentality of, okay, you're home from college now, you're supposed to get a job, get married, you know, it's time to start becoming a man. Playtime is over. So both myself and two of my friends that I'd grown up with actually started reading the Bible more, started reading the New Te Testament. Plus, I was used to having doing so much work and so much reading in college that when I left college, I kind of missed it. So I just started reading a lot. You know, I, I read The Color Purple. Um, like I said, I started reading the two things I would say that really moved me at that time was I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, one of the best books other than a law speech that I've, I've just ever read. I mean, it was so captivating that every single day, I would get on a train in the morning, you know, I was you know, looking for work, I'd on a train in the morning, I'd be reading Ma Ma Malcolm X. On my lunch break, when I found it, I'd be reading Malcolm X. On the train home, I'd read Malcolm X. I'd come home and I would start reading Malcolm X. Turn off TV and read Malcolm X. Um, and then I also started reading the New Te Te Testament. Because I said, well, it's time to get serious, it's also time to get serious about religion, so let me start reading more. But while I'm doing this, or as I'm reading the Bible more carefully, I keep seeing things that indicate one God. Reading the New Testament and reading what they believe to be the words of Jesus will keep saying one God. Um, it's like when they asked him, and understand this is you know, the according to, uh, when they asked him, he said, which is the most important c c commandment? And he said, the Lord thy God is one God. You should worship him and him alone. When he's in the garden, the day before they believed he was taken up to be cru crucified, he goes away from his disciples and he bows down. That's the other thing. Every time you keep reading, he keeps Moses falls down on his face. Um, Jesus falls down on his face. And as I'm learning a little bit more about Islam, I'm saying, well, when we're in church, we don't pray like that. But the Muslims pray like that. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But he says, you know, let this cup pass from me. In other words, don't let me be cru cru crucified. But not my will be done, thy will be done. If you read the, um, the, the, the Lord's Prayer, for those who know it, you know, our Father, which art in heaven, where's Allah? Where's Allah? He's in heaven above his throne. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Um, boy, it's been a long time since I've said it. I can barely remember it. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us far, far from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Um, uh, uh, amen. Even, because that, that came when they asked him, they asked Jesus, according to uh, the New Testament, how to pray. He does, and he says, this is how you pray. And I'm saying, well, this once again, he's not saying pray to me. He's saying, he starts out with our, 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 our Father. So the more I'm reading this, I'm saying, hmm, this doesn't seem to fit with what is going to place in church. So we had moved from the Bronx to Queens. We started attending um, a church in Far Rockaway where, where, where we lived. And in that church, they constantly kept saying, um, Jesus saves. Jesus can do this. With Jesus, all things are poss possible. But as I'm reading the New T Testament, um, According to the Gospels, Jesus says, on my own, I can do nothing. But in the Father, all things are possible. So I'm saying, well, that's not what they seem to be. I said, I'm reading something, but they're saying something else. Now, what's, what's happening also, I'm kind of back into the reading the um, Christian Muslim dialogue books that the Answer Allah community is giving out, and even went to visit the community. The benefit of it is that it's really making me look at what the Bible says versus what the Quran says versus what's preached in the church. And I'm saying, as I look at the lives of the prophets, even based on what the Bible is saying, it doesn't lead to what I'm being taught in church. It's leading to one God and Muhammad as his messenger. Now, I will tell you, this was not a joyous feeling at the time. What this was, a sense of fear. It's hard to change that which you've believed in your whole life. And sometimes when it begins to hit you that you can't just go along blindly with what you've been taught anymore, and what your family, what your entire family believes very strongly. This, this is not a, except for my father who wasn't really, he used to always tell me about, well, you know, I used to go to church a lot as a kid. You know, I used to do this, used, but everything was used to. <laughs> my grandmother who lived with us was still a big church go goer. And sometimes I would go with, with her, usually because there was something going to fun happen. You know, you're a kid, you don't really want to go and sit and listen. But afterwards, we're going to do this. So I used to go with her too, but she was a big church goer. So I have a family of big churchgoers. And so to begin seeing the world in a different way um, becomes a little fearsome at that point because you have to then question yourself and say, what are you going to do? And on top of that, I just had gotten a job. This is like in 87. I just had gotten a job, my first job in con con Congress with um, Floyd Flake in his first term. Now, by the way, if you don't know who Floyd Flake is, he is Reverend Floyd Flake. And he runs the biggest church in Southeast Queens, down the street from where his congressional office was. So I'm also finding myself in my search for faith, I'm actually going to church more while I'm doing this. As I be, you know, I'm trying to develop my spirituality, I'm going to church more. But the more I'm hearing it, the more I'm being critical. Now I'm, I'm hearing it more of a critical ear what's being said, and it's like, hmm, not so sure about that. Hmm, that's an in interesting issue. Um, at one point, I was in the office with an intern who was also an, an attender of the church, and we started talking about the issue of the Bible and whether is Jesus God or not. That became a debate. Is Jesus God or a servant of God? And I said, I want you to do is go look at the, look at the Bible, go look at the Gospels, and I said, you will not find anywhere in the Gospels where Jesus says, I am God, worship me. And she says, no, no, it's, it's in here. She starts looking and I'm like, now at this point, I've gone through this, word for word. So I'm sitting there watching, and I'm like, I said, you can sit there all day flipping pages. You're not going to find it. It's not in there. That doesn't come up until the Apostle Paul begins to use this term, Trinity, and so on and so forth. And I say, and if you want to take a look at Paul, Paul says, who was actually a Persecutor, once again, according to even um, Christian theologists and Christian histor historians are very clear that 
The Bible is what we would call that taif. It's a weak hadith. But if you look at what it says about Paul, it says Paul was basically a persecutor of the early Christians. But then he says that on the road to Damascus, I, I believe it was, um, that he had a vision of Jesus on the road. And Jesus told him to preach and so on and so forth, and that's how he became Paul the Apostle, yada, yada, yada. But the interesting thing, if you actually read Paul's, um, his description of what happened, it factually changes three times. One time he says that I fell off my horse and everyone else in the party remained mounted. The next time he says, we all fell off our horses. In one of the descriptions he says, we all saw the vision, but I only heard the voice. The next time he says, I only heard the voice. The next time he says, we all heard the voice, but I only saw the vision. So I'm like, you know, you guys are relying on this guy to tell you that Jesus is, you know, God in the flesh and so on and so forth. And yet the story that's in here can't even get straight. Now, if this is God's word, the way we say the Quran is God's word, there's not going to be these type of clear contradictions. And as I'm starting to, you know, read more, uh, understand the Quran a little bit better, even though I hadn't really read the Quran hardly at all before I took Shahada, it was really just the, the issue of Tawheed, 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 Tawheed. Allah used the Bible more to lead me toward Islam than the Quran. I didn't get my first Quran until after I took Shahada. But one thing that I found interesting was that if you look at the story of the birth of Isa in the Quran, and if you look at the um, story of the birth of Isa, not in the four Gospels, but in the book of Revelations, they're much more similar. And even the book of Re Revelations now, how do we get revelation? Revelation comes from Allah to the angel Jibril to the prophet, right? That's, I mean, basically, we can go into detail, but that's basically how, how it happens. If you look at the four Gospels, there are all kinds of reasons why the book was written. Luke says, all these people were talking about this. I think I have a better understanding of what happened than they did. So King so-and-so, whoever it was, I'm writing to you to tell you how it, how it went. There's no indication of revelation there. But in the book of Revelations, it says, you know, this is the book of Jesus Christ given to him by his, given to him by his father through the angel, right? So if you look at Revelations, it comes much more in, in, in line with um, what, what the Quran t t teaches us. So bottom line, I'm kind of headed toward this journey. I'm kind of, you know, what am I going to do, 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 do here? And at one point, the thing that became the scariest was when um, we were reading some, something and it said how well, you know, Jesus was not crucified. He did not die on the cross. I'm like, what? No, no, come on. I can go along with the Muhammad thing. I can go along with the one God. I can get rid of the Trinity and so on and so forth. But you're going to tell me our Lord Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross for our sins? I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can go here. This is completely uh, contradictory to everything I believed my entire life. And so this is, it's almost like heart pounding. It really becomes scary, you know? It, it reminds me of um, The Matrix, where, where Neo finds out he's been living in a dream the whole time. It's, you know, are you gonna accept, you know, this is the truth, there's no going back. You know, he takes the, what is it, take the red pill or the blue pill? And he said, if you take the blue pill, there's no going back. So at this point, I've begun to take the blue pill. <laughs> but I'm not sure what to do and when to do it. Um, but the most difficult time comes is that um, I get a call one day, one early morning, I'm headed to work, and I get a call and they say, your father's in the hospital. He's complaining of heart pains. So I tell my mother, we go to the hospital and um, see him, he's all tubed up and so on and so, so, so forth. Um, looks like he's gonna be in the hospital for weeks. But then, you know, toward the end of the week, we go see him, he gets better and better really quickly. And so Monday morning, we're supposed to go pick him up. And just as we're waking up, we get a call from the ho ho hospital. My mother yells downstairs, and she says, your father, I, I, she said, pick up the phone, your father's dead. 
And I pick up the phone and the doctor says he just had a massive heart attack and he died. So at, at this point, you know, um, my, my sisters are all older than I am. So they're all gone and married and they live out elsewhere. So it's just myself, my mother, my grandmother. And by the way, this is my grandmother's son. And so, you know, I'm doing my best to console my mother. And, you know, at first you have that mentality of this isn't happening. This, this, this didn't just happen. This is I'm going to wake up and it's going to be something di di different. But you kind of know, you know, this is not the matrix. This, 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 this is real. And so I'm just thinking to myself, you know, this is a test. Everybody, oh, you know, I don't know that much about Islam, but I've heard this part about being tested. And I said, this is a test. This happens to people. Now what are you going to do? And so at one point, I go see, um, I go by the funeral home, and I just go see, you know, my dad, and I think to myself, you know what? Life ends very quickly. It's, you know, you're not going to be able to play around. And I say to myself, I'm going to accept Islam. I'm not going to fool around anymore. I'm going to accept Islam. Of course, my knowledge later on became such, you know, Muhammad and uh, Abu Talib, Ibrahim and his father, you know. So I begin looking more and more, studying more. Every now and then I go out, I got my kufi on, because, you know, back in New York at the time, you got to wear your kufi and so on and so forth. You think that's a part of the deen. Um, so I start going slowly, you know, slowly into it. And then a friend of mine, my alhamdulillah, Allah's most merciful, because sometimes you can't take a journey on your own. Sometimes you need people to journey with you if you're going to have the courage to go there. And if you remember before, and I mentioned, you know, two of my best friends growing up, we're studying Islam together. And one of the brothers um, I've known since I was like 11 years old. And it was interesting because when we met, we were in living in Rockaway, Queens now, for those of you who know uh, n n New York. And the first day he came by my house, did I lose something? Did I lose something? Um, we're living, you know, we're in an elementary school. And the first day we start talking, it's like, well, where did you live? I said, oh, we, we just moved out here from the Bronx. He says, oh, my family just moved out here from the Bronx two months before your family did. Like, where did you live? I said, we live in Eden Wall Houses. We live in Eden Wall Houses right across the street. So that immediately, you know, we developed a bond because, do you, do you remember so-and-so? You remember this? You know, yeah, I knew him and so on and so forth. So we developed kind of a very close bond um, early on and to the point where, you know, we're like family. I never had a brother. I have three older sisters, but this is a brother who I've considered my, my, my brother um, all gr gr growing up. And then another one, and I'm still close to these brothers today. Every time I go to New York, I say I'm coming, and, you know, we try to hang out, whatever the case may, may be. So we're studying together, and unfortunately, one of the brothers um, ends up in a situation that takes him away from us for one and a half to two years. But, you know, we're staying in touch, we're going to visit him, and so on and so forth. And he took Shahada while he was upstate. And so Ramadan is coming. Now, at this point, I don't even know what Ramadan is. I haven't taken Shahada yet. I don't even know what Ramadan is. Um, but this is in the time period, this is 1988. So this is the time period Ramadan is coming from April to May. So, you know, my brother tells me about it. And I said, well, I'm going to try that. You know, I said, that sounds rough. You know, no food, no drink, and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. So now at first, you know, Allah forgives you for that which you don't know. I'm fasting from sunrise till Isha. So I'm a little late, but I'm going to Isha. And I got to tell you, that first day, I was like, no way, I, I, I can't do this. You know, I mean, I'm dying of starvation. I'm thirsty. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still at my mother's house at this point in time. You know, as soon as it gets dark, about an hour and a half after we were supposed to break fast, as soon as it gets dark, I run upstairs. She's still cooking, but I'm eating like everything in the house until i almost ready to pass out. I say, how can I do this for another 29 days? But alhamdulillah, I, I, I do it. You know, I keep doing it. And I keep saying I'm doing this for a lot. I'm, I'm going to become Muslim, so I'm doing it, and so on and so, so forth. And I make it, the whole, I make it the, the whole time, alhamdulillah. Now, a couple of weeks later, um, my, my brother has said that he is 
um, that he went down to Bro Brooklyn because he knew a brother that he worked on the job who was Muslim, who took him to the masjid and he took a sh sh shahada. So he's Muslim now. I said, well, all right, I got to I said, I know I'm going to do this. My mind's already made up. I'm just kind of nervous about taking that last step. I'm, I'm putting, I'm procrastinating, I'm putting it off. So one, one day he says, oh, yo man, I gotta run down to, um, to Master the Taqwa because I'm having an issue with my job and getting Friday off so I can attend Jumu'ah. So Abdul Malik, I know a lot of you probably know Abdul Malik uh, from Brooklyn. He's a brother who does, who has done the um, Jumu'ahs at Capitol Hill the past couple of years. Abdul Malik at that time was the assistant imam at Master the Taqwa in Brooklyn. And so he says, why don't you take, take a rundown with me? Um, so we go down. When we get down there, Abdul Malik is not there. So there's a restaurant next door. So we go into the restaurant. Um, it's a, 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 a halal restaurant. You know, a number of brothers are there, you know. So we kind of start talking. I start talking to his brother, Abdul Karim. Um, and, you know, good brothers, you know, and they're kind of welcoming us and so on and so forth. Uh, now, if you know where Master the Takwa is, you know, it's Bed-Stuy of Brooklyn, so it's kind of a rough neighborhood, a number of brothers there have been through some issues before accepting Islam. And they're kind of telling jokes, but all the jokes end in some Arabic word that we don't know what it is, you know, but they're cracking up laughing. So we start laughing, I don't know what it is. But interesting enough, every joke, you know, like I said, this is, this is um, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, so at the end of every joke, you know, some cafe ends up dying, you know, so this was, <laughs> I'm like, Islam is rough, boy. <laughs> Look at this. But then we get ready to leave, but the Adhan is called for Asr. And the brother Abdul Karim said, well, like, hey, you know, this is, man, very important prayer. You can't miss Asr, you gotta come miss. I haven't taken Shahada yet, but it's like, yeah, come on, come on, man. You, you gotta make, make, make Asr. So we go to make Asr, you know, he teaches me how to make wudu, gets me in line. And, you know, I stand in line, and the brother keeps pulling on me to come closer. But I'm like, how close do I need to get, you know? <laughs> So, you know, we get in line, we accept Islam. Imam, um, just, when it's, when it, just before time, Imam Siraj comes in, and he leads the Salah. And then afterwards, Abdul Qadim comes in and says, uh, Brother Imam, this brother here, you know, he's, 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 he's ready to accept Islam. You need to come. So he says, well, I can't come on up front. So I come up front, he asks him, what do you know about Islam? So I tell him, I said, well, I don't know that much, but what I do know is that there is no God, one God, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know Muhammad is his messenger. I know that Musa and Jesus and all the others were the messengers of God and not son. He said, well, okay, you already know, you know, the base of Islam. So, you know, he gives him shahada. You know, he says, repeat after me, and, and you know the rest of the story. And that's my uh, first day being a Muslim. Um, the interesting part of it is at first, as soon as you become a Muslim, you know, everybody wants to want to tell you something. So, by the way, my name when I was born is James William Johnson. But as soon as one of the brothers comes up to me, he says, he says, Aki, what's, uh, what's, what's your name? I said, I said James. Um, he says, Jamil. That's what I'm going to call you, J J Jamil. <laughs> All right, you know. You know, back then, everybody's changing their names at the time. So <laughs> well, whatever, you know. Uh, so now my brother is with me, so now he's calling me Jamil all the time. And the first thing, well, Aki, you know, back in the day, since the 80s, right? Now, can you imagine? Run DMC and them and how they're dressed and all of the gold down, you know. So it's like, Rocky, you know, Muslim men don't wear no gold. I'm like, oh man, I, <sighs> come on, man. It's got me, man. I just got this man from the jammy, man. The sisters was loving it, you know. By the way, I can't have no girlfriends in Islam. We don't have. How come nobody told me this stuff before Shahada? No girlfriends? I just started, see, you know. All right, I, all right, you know. And one thing he mentioned to me, he said, you know, he said, Aki, one thing I want to tell you. He said that people are who they are after they enter Islam, but they were before Islam. He said, if you know brothers who, when you said, let's say you say you want to, you know, we need to get the uh, masjid painted. The people were always there who say, oh, we got a project to do, we're going to do it before they were Muslim, are going to be there afterwards. He said, the ones who always had an excuse before they were Muslim, they can have an excuse as Muslims. He said, so, so just be prepared um, for, for that. Um, and, you know, for the most part, this is how, when I went home, and over time I told my mother that I accepted Islam, you know, and I wasn't sure how she was going to react. But she said, I know some brothers and sisters have very difficult times when this takes, takes place. 
Well, alhamdulillah, I was lucky. I was, I was blessed. My mother said, you know, I really hope that you were going to get involved in the church and so on and so forth. But I know that you're an intelligent person and that you're not going to do something, anything that's crazy. So if this is you, then, you know, this is what it is. You know, I, I accept that. Um, so it wasn't difficult. What I found interesting was that, like I said, at the time I was working for Congressman Flake. So by the way, I'm using his office for Salah and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, the office has noticed that you know, things are changing. You know, and I said, well, by the way, when I go in the office, I see that they say, we know you're, you're praying and so on and so forth. You know, they sort of talk, talk me you know, different. But it was what it was. And what's interesting that one um, young lady who worked with us said, well, are you going to have to now like, sell bean pies and send us off? <laughs> I said, well, um, I have a job. You know, I work for the congressman, just, 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 just like you. I said, no, we don't have to do these kind of things. And um, alhamdulillah, you know, just kept doing what needed to be done, found a master to go to Juma at on a regular basis and begin learning Islam. Uh, myself and those two brothers that I mentioned earlier formed an organization. Because where we lived, there was no master. So we formed an organization a couple of years later um, that became the Muslim organization in the area. We found places to pray. We rented out places to, to pray. And alhamdulillah, we were able to form a community. Um, as a matter of fact, right now, after all these years of trying to get some, they are finally at the point of being able to, um, someone gave them some property. This is not a rich community. This is a very poor community. A lot of public housing complexes in the area. And um, they've finally been given some property for a permanent masjid. And they're just trying to raise about um, $35,000 to get the rest of the renovations done so we can get it. So if anybody wants to help out, you know, feel free to let me know. But this is my story. Um, I hope that it was of some value to you. I hope I didn't speak too long. And if it benefits in any way, shape, or form, alhamdulillah, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, anything I've said that is wrong and hopefully I didn't offend, that's from me and I ask Allah to forgive me and to cause you to forget. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He did a pretty good job, didn't he? See that? MashaAllah. Okay, uh, this is going to be the question and answers portion. Um, salah is coming up. We're going to pray at 7 o'clock. So I'd recommend, if you can, write down your questions and I'll read them. But if you really feel pressed and you want to ask a personal question, just raise your hand and... Yeah, get them on if they write down, or right? you know, we're all brothers and sisters, we're just having a conversation. I was just trying to say something. Yes. You know what, Aki, in all honesty, I have difficulty remembering that. And I think the reason I have difficulty remembering that is because I never really went directly to my, like, my grandmother, you're right, we were close. She actually moved in um, with us when I was five years old. Matter of fact, she took my room. Um, so she's been with, she's lived with us since I was very small. Um, I don't know if I ever kind of went, matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I never actually kind of went directly to her and said I'm Muslim. I just kind of let it show over time and I let her ask me a question and so I'm Muslim because I do this, we still believe in Jesus and so on and so forth. But she was pretty non-reactionary. She tended to focus more on, matter of fact, she would ask me, well, how are you living? in a sense of, are you doing the right things? More than it was, oh, you should do this. I, I, alhamdulillah, I never had that even from my aunts, uncles, cousins. Matter of fact, some of my cousins came and started asking more questions about it. And in some cases where they were beginning to maybe even question their own faith a little bit. Uh, matter of fact, one of, my question, one of my cousins actually came to, to visit my wife and I after we got married. You know, this is years later if we got married. And she actually took shahada in the masjid in, in Rockaway, where I'm ta talking about. Unfortunately, she ended up turning back to Christianity. May Allah guide her. Please make do with that. Allah guide her back. Because her mind is still o open, but I think the issue for her was comfortability in a sense of not the Akita as much as what she's comfortable doing. Um, but to answer your question, we never really had like a direct thing. It was more or less over, over time and little conversations here and there. But nothing ever difficult. I have a question. Yes, I can. How did the senator react? Um, I never worked for a senator. Oh, I'm sorry, the <laughs> congressman, sorry. Um, congressman Flake was actually, I wasn't working for Greg at that time. Um, congressman Flake was actually, he never really brought the issue up or made an issue of it. 
But at the same time, he and I were never, we never had a lot of personal conversations oh, okay. in that sense. You know, it's more like he's a congressman, I'm an employee, and so on and so forth. Um, and it was like, hey, cool, you know, whatever. Okay. Yes, okay. Assalamu alaikum. In your journey, did you uh, have any um, fears of like being alienated by your, your, your older sisters when you became Muslim? Um, not really. My sisters and I um, are very close. We're, we're very, very close. And what became more of an issue was, and in many ways, as I was studying Islam and studying many of these things, you know, my, my family has a little bit of a, how would you put it, kind of a radical nature to it anyway, a little bit. So th things like, you know, black power and this and that, and so on and so forth, Malcolm X, you know, is already, we have a little bit of that anyway. And so to say, well, I'm looking at Islam, if anything, what it made them do to some degree was at least take a look. You know, take a look at the literature, take a look at this, ask questions and so on and so, so forth. Um, I'm still making do it at some point, somebody takes a step further. Um, but it was already a little bit of that rebellious nature was there. You know, one of my older sisters finally stopped putting up Christmas trees, you know. Um, so it was, it was never an issue uh, of that. And like I said, we've kind of talked all along, even as I was going through it. So it wasn't like something sudden. Sisters, don't forget if you have questions, uh, let me know or send your papers forward. Don't be shy. Inshallah, we have no gun. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> How was your feeling when you go first time to Haji? Because you don't know that the situation there. But, but you know, when I first made Hajj? Uh -huh. Is that what the you're saying? Time, yes, the first oh, time, yes. Well, my first and only time. I mean, I've made Umrah twice, but I only made Hajj once. Um, and that was actually just, what year is this, 2012? That was uh, seven years ago. Um, when I first made Hajj. Um, interestingly enough, I have, I had tra I've traveled a lot. In my previous job, I used to travel a lot, including to the Muslim world. Um, I used to wonder, and I'm going to get to your answer to your question, I used to wonder, how come the Muslims weren't stronger in the world? You know, I mean, do we really have to be on the level of Sahaba to be successful as Muslims? Um, especially we have this oil wealth, we have this, we have that, well, these countries, how come we're not more powerful in the world? And then I went over to the Muslim world and I said, ah, now I see. <laughs> and so, you know, I had already kind of gotten out of my mindset that every country I was going to go to was going to be on point when it got to, 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 to Islam. And I had taken a couple of classes, one um, with, who taught the class? I think Safi and Muhammad, the brother from Canada, um, from Dal Salaam. Muhammad al Sharif. Um, I already taken classes with them on the Hajj. The first time I thought I was going to be going and didn't go. And then I took a class here with Sheikh Motaz when I knew I was going to be going. So I was a little more alerted to some of the things that to expect. I was alerted to expect to be patient, very patient, um, more than you normally would be, to expect that you're going to see a lot of Jahaliyyah when you go over there in regards to even what the rituals are and what people are doing, to the fact that there's gonna be, there are a lot of different cultures and things like that. Um, so what may be the norm to you isn't necessarily gonna be the norm to everybody, so be prepared and be relaxed and stay focused on what you're there for. Um, but I would say the two most interesting things, one, I mean, to see the Kaaba for the first time is always, you know, it's a bit stunning. I think the only thing that I ever saw that ever made me have similar was just a month before and I'd gone to Egypt and I I'd, I'd saw the pyramids for the first time. But to see the Kaaba, to see Allah's house, you know, up close and personal for the first time, um, especially if you go upstairs to the third floor at night, because the first, we got there late, um, so we made Umrah and then we went upstairs um, to the third level of the building. And the brother said, come, come on over here, one of our brothers from Egypt who was kind of leading our group. He was kind of like our interpreter um, between us and the Saudis. He said, I, can you see first time, come on over here to, to the wall. And I went and I looked down at night with the light shining on it. And it's a, it's, it's a stunning sight. It's, it's really a stunning sight. You know? And it looks so beautiful as people are moving in unison, even though you know if you're down in the middle of it, all, all hell's breaking loose. But it's, 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 an, it's just a beautiful thing to, to, to watch. And it just made me realize we're eight in a room, 
And like I said, I've traveled a lot, but I've traveled a lot with congressional delegations. So I'm used to staying in certain places in certain ways. Um, when I do that, and here we're eight brothers in a room, you know, we gotta keep calling every day for toilet paper. But when I was, when we were going to, um, before we went to Muzdalif, when we're going to Arafat, we were on a bus, and I remember seeing an old African woman walking up the hill as the bus is passing her. And I mean, she is literally, you know, this is her lower body, her upper body's like this. She's bent over completely on a cane, trying to make it up the hill to Arafat. And when I saw that, I said, there's nothing for me to complain about. I see people who are, who have come to make Hajj, like we talk about people having all kinds of accommodations at Hajj, but when you see people who have come to make Hajj and they have no accommodations, and it's not just the men, but they have their wives with them and they have their children with them, and they're staying, here's our spot in the street, we're staying in a tent, it makes you feel like, you know, I, I can't be more blessed. I have a place to stay. I have people who are feeding me every day, you know, in, in a restaurant. What do I have to complain about? Um, so, but it, it was just a development of patience that was great. And uh, just, as, I'll just ask you a question in a second, but also, I, you know, for the sisters, um, the one part of the story I didn't tell was that um, I actually met my wife before I took Shahada. And we started seeing each other a little bit, but then I accepted Islam, and then I learned what I mentioned to you before, you know, and this girlfriend stuff. So the issue became, what are you gonna do? And so I told her, I said, well, you know, we can't function in this, in this, this way, um, but I don't wanna force you to do something you don't wanna do. I wanna marry a Muslim woman. And I know that marriage is hard enough as it is, it's gonna be harder if there's two different religions, so I'm not doing that, I wanna marry a Muslim woman. I said, but you have to decide this for yourself. So if you want to accept Islam, then we can talk about getting married. But if not, that's up to you and, you know, whatever. So she used to go to programs and functions and so on and so forth. And then it came to a particular point where she said, you know what? I'm going to accept Islam. And I think at one of the functions we were having out there in Queens, um, one of the other moms from, from Brooklyn gave us sh shahada and we got married a, a few months later. And it's not always easy, you know, in the beginning, because one thing, you're coming from one way of life and you're learning a new way of life. And, you know, for the sisters, see, one thing my wife is reminded of this all the time, I was fortunate, like I said, because sometimes you need somebody to take that journey with you. I had my two best friends, my, you know, these are my boys, you know, taking a journey with me. She had no one. You know, Islam for men is one thing in this society, for women it's another thing. So it was much harder for her. But she kept on, kept on, began to learn and so on and so forth, and now she's, you know, a very active Muslim, well, I mean, you all know Nabila. I hope some of you know Nabila, know my wife. Um, but it's a journey, and one thing, alhamdulillah, some brothers who had been through this before told me, they said, Aki, be patient. If you shove it down her throat, she's gonna throw it up. So you have to be patient. We've been through this, you know. Always learn from people who've been there before you. I'm not the first brother to go through this. The others have gone through this. And then I sometimes met other brothers who were, you know, I, I met this sister as in a, a woman. You know, she's not Muslim. We're talking about getting married and so on and so forth. I would never tell them don't marry them, but I would say, brother, let me give you some thoughts before you go through this because what might seem acceptable to you now, you know, you're in love with this woman and so on and so forth, and you think, we're cool, and everything's all right, and we'll be all right, and she's gonna do this, and what's cool, what's okay to you now, isn't gonna be okay to you. If, if you're serious about your dean, but she's not m m Muslim, what seems acceptable to you now in behavior isn't gonna be acceptable in three years. At that point, her acting in a certain ways and behaving in certain ways might not bother you now because all you know is that you b b b believe. But as the Master said, a man has not yet entered your heart. So in three years, when you've grown like this and she's still out here, it's not gonna be okay. And a couple of the brothers who I had, um, 
counseled on that, who went and did, did it anyway. By the way, those, those marriages are over. Some, one case in, in a year, another case in two, three years, it was like, I'm already fed up. I, I already can't de de deal with it. Um, but if you've married a woman who has accepted Islam, you understand we all grow at our own pace. The same thing, I have to say the same thing, I guess, for women who have, who have married, who, of course, the women aren't supposed to marry and accept Muslim men, but maybe your iman is stronger than his iman. But you have to try to work to, 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 together to build up. We have to be patient with each, with each other. And alhamdulillah, there were times when it was like, I'm sure for both of us, for her and I, it was like, ah, you know. But we were friends, and we liked each other, we loved each other. And alhamdulillah, we, we, we've grown, and we've raised our children in the Muslim c c community. Aki, you had a, a song, Aki? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I was uh, wondering if you could enlighten us about your experience learning Arabic and the Quran. How did you transition to, from English to try and learn Arabic and so forth? Transition? Well, this whole cook, this, this whole discussion has been in English, right? Aki, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, one thing I would recommend for any new Muslim is, and, and you don't know, you, know, you can't know that what you don't know. So as I began to get my dean, and I found a group, and I began to learn um, Quranic recitation. And for all those people who taught me back then, who tried to teach me back then, may, may, may Allah bless them tremendously. But a lot of them didn't know, didn't know but so much. So I'm learning my first um, Quranic recitation through transliteration. And the other I'm picking up very quickly. I'm picking them up within, you know, 15 minutes to a half an hour, you know, because I was blessed with a good memory. But the problem is, my recitation is terrible, because the person who's teaching me his recitation isn't but so good, who doesn't know Arabic. But, but he's, he's given what he has. Um, so we're trying. So, and the person who's teaching me Arabic, how to, you know, read Arabic and read the Quran, his knowledge of reading isn't but so good. But that was what was available to me at the time. So what happened is, yeah, I'm learning what they're teaching me, but what they're teaching me is, has its limitations. Thank you, it has its limitations. And so what's happening now is that I'm constantly relearning and redoing. So I take classes here, I take the um, Rook class here, so I can learn. I, I never learned it most of the Tajweed early, early on. Um, my pronunciation of the, um, of the Arabic, the Quran, so even just the sounds of letters early on was pretty, pretty bad. Um, and, and one brother in the mashup kept trying to talk to us about pronouncing things properly. And I'm like, well, okay, I'm doing my best. That's not a big deal. Until I learned later on that it is important to recite the Quran properly. Um, so I'm in a stage much later on in my years where now I, I, I've learned something, but now I'm relearning it now so I can be better. But alhamdulillah, you know, I was able to put my children into the schools at a young age. And when I went back to New York, and when I took my, my oldest son, who's 17 now, when I took him back to New York, to where like some of the brothers had taught me back then when he was a little boy, but he was um, in preschool here. And um, I forgot the, the, the sister's name who was running, who not was running the preschool, but one of the te teachers at that time from Egypt. And of course, Brother Harun, you know, was teaching them recitation. So I'd go back, and he would recite, and he'd be like, but he sounds like an Arab, you know, he's better. So now, he so now he's, he's taught here, and now he's in the, um, one of the teaching assistants um, for the Sunday school. So my kids are better than I am in regards to that, because they, they learn young. But, you know, it's, it's a journey, but it's not easy. But I always re re remember what the Messenger of Allah said, you know, those who recite beautifully, you know, they get blessed for it. Those who struggle with di 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 difficulty, di difficulty get twice the blessing. And so, you know, you just keep struggling. I have a writing question. Yes, sir. It says, uh, two parts. It says, uh, one, how do, you feel, how do you think that your father would, would have felt, uh, uh, you know, when, you, when uh, you accepted Islam, if he was still living? That's part one. And then part two is, what part of uh, reading uh, the Malcolm X book really attracted you? Um, well, to answer the first question, I mean, the real answer to that is Allahu Alam. Um, but my dad, knowing my, my, my dad, I think he probably would have asked me certain questions about it and this and that. He probably would have brought up my mother more than himself. 
well, you know, be careful because your mother, you know, you want this and that, you know, that would be more his concern. It's like kind of when he dropped me off at college, you know, you know how parents come and they stay and they go to orientation with you and so on and so forth? Well, he and my, my uncle, his brother, his older brother, you know, they kind of, we got to college, they rested for an hour, you got everything, you got the money, see you, gotta go. <laughs> oh, by the way, call your mother, tell her you're okay. <laughs> So it probably would have been, hey, if that's what you decide, and so on and so forth, it's pretty cool, but you know, talk to your mother, she might be this, that, and that. That probably would, what would have been more of his response. Um, I think what got to me most about the autobiography of Malcolm X, besides it being extremely well written, was the issue of transformation. Constantly seeing something, believing in it as truth, and being dedicated to that transformation even though his initial transformation was not correct. You know, there's one part of the book, or if you like look at one of his do documentaries, when he comes back from making Hajj, and he says, I'm still a Muslim. When the reality is, no, you are now a Muslim. <laughs> you were not a Muslim before. You thought you were, but you were not. But when he made the transformation, he was always extremely dedicated to it. Somebody who said, if this is the truth, I'm going to follow it, and I'm, I'm on it, this is who I am. And understanding, coming from, you know, Malcolm, he's originally from Detroit, but I spent a lot of time in New York City, I guess it was something that I could relate to. You know, these kind of things, having, you know, spent time in the street. Um, Alhamdulillah, I was always a good student, but, you know, but I spent my time in the street. So I could relate to spending time in the street, engaging a lot of nonsense. But then, you know, find, finding God and being committed to it. These days, it reminds me of, the, um, the sorcerers of, of, Fir, of Fir'aun, who they were one way, but once they saw the truth, it was like, we're with this, I don't care what you do. We're willing to die. We don't care what, you, you know, what, go, go, what goes on. And just the issue of you know, men becoming leaders, and I say that not in the sexist way, but you know, we've had a lot of issues in the African-American community around men being leaders. Leaders in the household, leaders in the community, and the issue of men taking their place and being, taking the weight of responsibility. Not the privilege, not the honor, not the joy, but the weight of responsibility of being leaders, which is what I was taught that I was supposed to be. That, um, I don't know who asked the question, but that kind of connected with me. Yes, I keep a battle. Assalamu alaikum. This is just a comment for Brother uh, Jamil about his seriousness in Islam. Uh, MashaAllah, he attended the RUQ program at PGMA. And he brings his son. Both of them are registered in the same class. Is it uh, Tajweed? Tajweed 1, 12? We were taj Tajweed 1 at the last, yeah. Tajweed 1 in the last semester. And the teacher, Wallah, this is true. The teacher, he, he, he came to us at Sunday school, he said, why Brother Jamil's son is not teaching at Sunday school. He's very qualified to be one of the teachers in Sunday school. And uh, when I, uh, I think he told the brother, he told them in the class, if I am late, the teacher, if I'm late, you take the lead in the class, in the Tajweed class. And I also, I will take that opportunity to let everybody know that uh, uh, Sheikh Zara, inshallah, he will start to be, to, to to hold the class, the Tahfiz class. You asked me, Brother Jamil, about the mm -hmm. Tahfiz class. Brother Sheikh Zaria will, be, will do the Tahfiz class on Sunday. The, the RUQ program, we have a Tahfiz class, and we have few students registered. So if anyone is interested to register for that, to make Tahfiz, Hifz, and you have to be qualified to be in that class. So you'll be tested, and then you'll be enrolled in that class. So just to comment about the Brother Jamil, mashallah, his seriousness in the... Uh, uh, teaching his children. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Okay. Um, Asalaamu alaikum. Um, um, after you, you become a Muslim, have you been able to um, win over any body from, you know, member of your family, extended family? I mean, what I mean is able to convert somebody to become a Muslim. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to make clear. You were asking, was I able to give da'wah to members of my family where they would accept Islam? Yes. Um, as I mentioned, one of my cousins did
did accept Islam. She came by the house to see me and my wife uh, on a Juma This is when I was in um, New York. And she was living in Virginia at that time, but she was up visiting. And she decided she wanted to come to Jumu'a with us. And she'd been asking me questions and I'd been sending her literature. And my wife and I would always go down and visit her um, in Virginia every year. And so she came by that day and she took Shahada. What concerned me was, at first it was like, well, don't tell me, you know, the family and so on. I don't want them to know. I don't want them to pressure me and this and that at, at the time. And at the time it was just, living wise, it was just her and her, um, her child. But after a while, I began to become concerned because it was still a, I haven't told anybody yet, which indicated to me you're not growing enough strong in your faith that you want to do this. Um, and then I heard that the baby had been christened or something like that. And I was like, and, I, and what I tried to do at the time was, I think we had moved shortly after that here to Maryland, so we're in Columbia. And she was looking to possibly be closer to family because she felt kind of alone. So I said, well, why don't you try to, because she was working for the post office, why don't you try to transfer to um, Columbia? And I did that because I wanted her to be close to us and be part of a community and you know, have my, my, my wife right there to have a sister that she could relate to. Um, but that never happened, and she met somebody else, and he was supposedly Muslim. I don't know what to really say about it. So I said, well, this is good, you know, he can pull her in, but he's Allahu Alam. Um, you go to the house, there's a photo of um, Elijah Muhammad, I think, on the wall somewhere, so this is, this is what you're dealing with. Um, so next thing I know, she comes by to visit us, and she's got a cross on her neck, and I, I, I bring her husband over here, and I say, what's happening with my cousin? She's got this cross, well, this, that, and the other, and so on and so forth, and this is where it is. Uh, no one else accepted Islam. People have talked to me about it. Sometimes, I have to tell you, it's a difficult feeling, because sometimes you hear about someone who's accepted Islam, and then their mother accepted Islam, and then their sister accepted Islam, and then their cousin accepted Islam. And the first thing that you think about is, I must, it's got, got to be me. I'm not doing things right. I'm not giving the dawah right. Something is wrong with the way I'm giving dawah because, you know, I, have, I know other people, they take shahada, and three and four and five members of their family take shahada. And that's not happening for me. So what am I doing wrong? But then, you know, I remember also that, you know, it's the hearts are in Allah's hands. And he's not going to make somebody Muslim because I want them to be. If, you know, if Abu Talib didn't become a Muslim, who can, who's better to give dawah? Who was, you know, outside of the belief, who was almost a better Muslim than Abu Talib in regards to his actions? And he never accepted Islam with the Messenger of Allah asking him to. So I have to, you know, balance those two things, but at the same time then say, you still need, need, need to work harder. So worse come to worse on Yama Kiyama, and I say you did the best you could. And I'm sorry, I can't. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi Well, my, mine is a comment because uh, what you are expressing, uh, that sense of frustration, we all go through it. But the challenge that you have brought here this evening is. For some of us who are born into Islam, I have seen what I would describe some level of spiritual arrogance, you know, because the effort you made to study Arabic, to study Quran, a lot of us have not done that. So if you think you've not done enough of that, what I'm taking from this lecture today is that I have to join you in that class because I know my pronunciation is terrible too. <laughs> So, uh, what I'm saying in effect is, for us, most of us who are new African Americans, the new immigrants, when you talked about the way you met your wife, sometimes you find it frustrating that those who are even born into Islam, Muslim names from the onset, go into college and end up marrying non-Muslims mm -hmm. under the excuse of what I called, quote and unquote, stupid jihad. 
Stupid she had? Yes, because when they bring these women in, mm -hmm. what do you get? Those kids don't know whether they want to be Christians or Muslims. Mm -hmm. And you find it all over. So uh, what you have done tonight, don't feel frustrated. You're going to get some other members in your Just like a law I have a writing question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Um, <laughs> said, how did uh, 911 strengthen your dean? And also, how did others react to you after 911? Uh, you know, interestingly enough, I've actually been asked that question even um, on the Hill. Um, at 9-11, I was already working in Congress um, down here. And the first thing that came to mind, I said, is it's kind of like, uh, it's going to be on now, you know. <laughs> you know, the question was, first, is this going to be an attack as part of a series of attacks? That was actually my biggest con concern. Because if that starts to happen, you think they rounded up people after 9-11? You let there be a series of attacks. And I remember, um, particularly that night, when I came home, it was time for Isha. And I think I, I lived here at that point for about two months. We'd moved in June, and this was um, sep September. So I, I, I came for Isha. And when I started to, to leave, uh, my wife was like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Isha. You're going to the master now after what happened? I said, look, it, now is not the time to be afraid. I mean, fear a lot. It says, what are we going to do? You know, the, these are the times that were tested. So I came for I Isha, and I, I remember the big uh, American flag for those brothers who were here they had on the fence. I'm not sure what that was about, but <laughs> I was like, uh, brothers, give, give me a break here. <laughs> but I guess, you know, brothers were doing, you know, may a lot be pleased with their brothers were doing whatever they felt was, was best. And the funny thing, though, what happened that night was that when I left here after Isha, and I went, I was going back to my house, a, a, a cop car passed me. And, you know, I didn't think anything, a cop car passed you, so what? So then I pull in front of my house, I pull up, and then the cop car is back, well, matter of fact, two cop cars passed, and the cop car is back af after I pass by and I pull in my driveway, and then two cop cars, as I'm getting stuff out the car, come up and pull in front of my house. I'm like, so what's my, my, my first thought? Are oh, they coming to get a brother? They, they know something about me, you know, and they just, they, they're running down a brother. And, and when they stop, like I said now, like I said, where I'm from, when the cops stop in front of your house, they're coming for you. <laughs> but interestingly enough, they stop and park in front of my house, and they walk down the street for a domestic disturbance. I was wondering, what y'all down there in front of my house for? You could park right down there. But when I went to work, and um, if some of you brother, probably know Brother Anu, the attorney, he was working um, in my office at the, at, at the time. And so we're kind of looking at the situation, and it's like, all right, well, you know, what are you going to do? And I'm talking to the congressman. And in that first day back, not everybody was there. Um, so it was just a few of us in the office, in the office with the congressman. And he says, you know, some of the things, just to let you know some of the congressmen I used to work for, his father and mother used to be members of the Nation of Islam. So even though they eventually all went back to Christianity, so that kind of made him, hey, Muslims, hey, you hey, know, no, no, no problem, no, no, no biggie. You know, so we used to do things like, you know, have a round table on um, Sharia compliant finance, because he was on the banking committee and those kind of things we were trying to move forward with. But then after that, remember, he's a politician. Now, he's a good guy, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't work for a lot of different people, but I'd work for, for him, but he's a politician. So his issue is, yeah, a lot of the things that we were trying to work on, I don't know about if we can do that right now, you know, at this point in time. But interestingly enough, I actually get many cases a lot of good feedback. One of my neighbors immediately came across the street, um, I think, where are they from? From Ghana. Immediately came across the street, and she said, I just wanted to know if everything was okay, because I know you guys are from New York, and just want to make sure all your family and stuff was okay. So a lot of things were good. Um, I went out that Sunday to go shopping with a kufi on because the kids' schools, you know, Dar es Salaam had, had been closed for a week um, right after that. But I went out that Sunday, uh, and my wife stayed home with, with them the whole time. But I said, you know, before I go, before I let her and them go back to work, I'm going out, you know, Muslim down because I want to see what the atmosphere is. So I went out kufi though, not a word, not a word. I go to work, 
you know, things are cool. Somebody then asked me, we used, at that point, we were already holding Juma on the Capitol, and the Capitol had been closed to any but members and staff for a period of time. So I went and spoke to the captain, and I said, look, we have you know, regular meetings here, June 1, so on and so forth, what's going to be the issue? And one brother said, well, maybe we shouldn't do that for now because you know, this, that, we don't want to make it seem, we're the ones bringing pe 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 people in. I said, okay, you know, if we start making it seem like we want to practice undercover, then anytime they see people practicing, they will be like, well, maybe those are the terrorists. But I went and spoke to the, the, the um, ca ca captain. He said, well, we're putting in some new se 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 security procedures. Once we have that in place, we'll tell you exactly what it is you need to do, and you can go right back to having, them, you know, having your regular um, Friday weekly meetings. And that's what we did. No issue. As soon as, as and it wasn't like, OK, we'll let the Muslims back in a month or two after everybody else. You know, once the capital was open to visitors again, it was open for Jumu'a at the same time. So, yeah, there were knuckleheads, members of Congress who said stupid things and did stupid things. But for, for the most part, I did not have a problem. It was, I mean, Allah made it easy for, for me. Okay, uh, we're going to break for salutation. Jazakallah, Karun, for listening and being patient. <laughs>